Trademark it, put it in the books. We're car talk now. I'm Clank, he's Clack. That what? Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Superhero FX Podcast On the Road. Um, you may notice our sound is a little different than normal. That's because at the moment, Jacob and I are somewhere in rural Michigan on a road trip to Detroit. Um, we have both been very busy of late. We know we haven't given you guys a good recording in a while. So we decided, um, since we spent the last two or three hours of this uh, road trip already discussing ethics and uh, superheroes and all sorts of random stuff, why don't we just hit uh, record and continue our conversation? So Jacob is driving, I am sitting passenger, and we're going to talk to you guys today about Supernatural. Um, and hopefully you will be able to hear all of us. As we say, we apologize the sound quality may not quite the same, but you get a moving, exciting podcast on the road. So, Jacob, how you doing? So... I'm doing all right. I gotta be honest. I am not entirely certain that this is going to be a salvageable episode. But <laughs> speaking as the person who does the audio editing, uh, if this doesn't sound very good, guys, I'm sorry. I promise I did my best. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I should say fellas or folks. Uh, <laughs> folks is probably the best word. I've been thinking a lot about language lately. Um, I'm really excited to get into this topic, though. Uh, this is a show that I. Uh, I basically prodded Matthew into watching until he did, uh, which truth, which uh, you know also happened with um, with Avatar: The Last Airbender, kind of. But I was more gentle about it. Supernatural. I was really like, man, there's a lot of good stuff to talk about here. Um, both in like these things are problematic, and in like this is a really interesting portrayal um, ways. And so, like one of the things that you mentioned about uh, uh, during your your opening run up about. We haven't given you guys a good podcast in a while, though. Did make me chuckle and like, I'm not sure if this one's going to be good because of the sound. <laughs> but at least well, we're going to try to give you some quality content. We'll give you a good discussion, to be sure. Yeah, and, and it's true. I mean, um, with Avatar, it was you and Paul, the former hosts, so yeah. currently some of the hosts, and Mary, my partner, all really pushing uh, on this. Um, and with Supernatural, uh, um, you and some other people in our friends group, um, your partner, um, had really kind of convinced me it was worth giving a shot. Um, as well as the fact that you had been so right about Avatar. Um, I'll say from the beginning, Supernatural is no Avatar. <laughs> Supernatural is a very different show. Well, and... I, and I just mean, like, I, I'll be honest, I I loved Avatar. I enjoyed a lot of parts of Supernatural. Some parts of it I found very eye-rolly. But most important, it certainly did give us a lot to talk about, because I think it is a very interesting take on the whole hero idea and what it gets into about ethics and cosmology and mythology. Um, and there's just a lot from this show that we should talk about. Right. And what was the major reason that I wanted you to be familiar, more familiar with the show than just my, you know, sometimes incoherent ramblings on the topic? Because when, when you get right down to it, a lot of the stuff that we discuss, a lot of the topics we talk about, about um, what our heroes are supposed to do, can we kill is a topic we've had that Supernatural gets into yep. get into the topic so um, you know when, when our heroes have, have agency or when they have to make a hard decision and which ones are justified and which and, and it gets into the two acceptable sacrifices and, and when we don't do those things and in some of the problems that come as a result of us putting our own personal priorities ahead of, of the greater good and, and also whether there's anything wrong with that. We had a long discussion about that uh, sure. at that point um, in a recent episode. So, and, and I think that uh, you came away with it, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you came away with it with that same idea that there's a lot to talk about here. I, I personally love the show. Mm -hmm. I understand that it is not the best television show ever written. <laughs> uh, it is certainly one of the longest-running television shows I've ever seen. Oh, so true. Um, but uh, you only got through season five, is that correct? Yeah, and that's good. So, uh, spoiler warning, we are going to be spoiling lots of things from season uh, the first five seasons. Um, I stopped watching after season five. Uh, I may get into why, but that's a, that's a different question. Though it is a little bit tangential to some of the ethics stuff we're going to discuss. Um, uh, and, but, so we'll definitely be spoiling everything from the first five seasons. Um, and frankly, though, um, Jacob will probably also be referencing some things that happen in later seasons. Um at this point in time, Supernatural has become so much a part of the cultural zeitgeist that I feel like there are some things that we're not going to spoil that much. I mean, like, I had never watched an episode of this show in my life when I sat down, and yet I knew that 
Sam and Dean both die fairly frequently, <laughs> as do quite a number of other characters. Um, and if I just spoiled any of you, congratulations, you've been living under a rock for quite some time. <laughs> well done. Um, and that just sounds like I insulted my audience. I really don't mean it that way. It's more an honest congratulations. Because frankly, for a while, I wished I was hearing a lot less about Supernatural. Yeah, I, I don't know how you... If you if you're spoiled by this, I don't know how you did it, but uh, well done. Yeah, really. exactly. Um, but yeah, so, and, and we can talk more about the quality of the show at a later point. I, I, I certainly found it very enjoyable. What I described it is as um, some of the best trash TV I've ever seen, <laughs> um, which I think is a fair assessment. But, um, but either way, let's, let's get started with, um, what's your kind of overall take on this show? Like, we're going to get into some of the other questions, but like, especially from some of the hard, like, what do you think this show is doing differently? than every other show you've seen in terms of kind of the question, the, the way it approaches all these questions of superheroes and heroes and stuff that we wrestle with. So so that's a that's a complicated answer. Because one of the reasons I got into the show in the first place, one of the reasons I was really, really strongly pulled into it, and the thing that it, that it did that differentiated it from other uh, occult shows that I had seen, um, is really twofold. One, they seem to do a lot more research. Uh, there are like monsters and elements from different they pull from many different mythoi which I think yep. is really interesting um, and and it's not like all uh, Eurocentric they have although it gets that way later on because they run out of ideas uh, <laughs> spoiler alert but um, and then but the other thing was that you know it's, but it's, let me just jump into that first thing for a second yeah, yeah. I will say kind of in a meta thing but it's something that our listeners know we care about one thing I was kind of impressed by is that when they do pull from non you know Western European yep. mythology, they don't play into a lot of the racist stereotypes they like, go off and get. Yeah, like, like when they pull the Wendigo, which is a Native American right. uh, uh, myth uh, myth is the wrong term, I forget the the, the proper term, but it's it's in that legend, vein. yeah. Right. They don't they don't even touch the uh, they don't touch it in ways that uh, that one episode of Buffy pangs Oh god, yeah. Uh, god, that was so bad. Yeah, and like I like I, I remember because I, I was reading an article uh, a couple of years ago, but I remember reading about this where uh, it was written by someone who was Haitian and was a, a practitioner of the Voodoo practices, from which our sort of cliche of voodoo comes from. Um, and and they were talking about some movie that had come out that was really bad about stereotyping, and in kind of an offhand way, they mentioned Supernatural as like not the best by any means, but one of the better examples of how to draw upon those stories without going too deep into the cliches. Right. Um, and that was something that I remembered. It stuck with me. And then I, I think in some of the other episodes, like, you know, it's still probably white people telling other people's stories. And I'm sure it is a lot more problematic than it could be, than it should be. But it's also a lot better than it could be, right. which is something I give them credit for. Right. But then the other reason I got into it, and this is what why I stuck with it, and I honestly still stick with it to this day, uh, and... You can criticize me all you like for that because they, I, I deserve it. Uh, but like, like what you like, no critique here. Yeah, it's uh, so it is. It's a monster of the week horror theme show, or it started out that way. But it was really actually just a buddy road trip show. Yeah. Uh, where the buddies happened to be brothers, and I just I really dug that theme, and and we talked a little bit about this um, about the the male male friendship portrayal, but Sam and Dean's relationship with each other in some ways is intensely problematic in, in how it informs their decision making and the some of the ethical quandaries with, with what happens there. But one thing I will say is that they have a very they have a very deep relationship and eventually they even talk with each other about their feelings. Yeah. And I, I, I have mixed feelings on that, mostly very positive. As we, as, as I mentioned on the fan fiction episode, there is some, um, we did the fan fiction, I had not watched most of it. But I talked about that point that I, 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 that my understanding was that a lot of people looked to Supernatural and saw a lot of queer baiting and like other kind of like problematic behaviors in front of the way that they sort of hint at acknowledging that a lot of people could see a romance between those two, but that they would never quite acknowledge that. And we don't need to go back into that debate because we right. covered a lot in the fan right, fiction right. one. And so I, I do want to name that as a potential problem. But yep. to say, other than that, I do agree with you that it is one of the best portrayals of male-male relationship that I've seen. Um, and I, it's still deeply toxic, right? Like, oh. they still had a, a very toxically masculine father figure 
that stunted their emotional development. Right. But that they're able to... Yeah, I mean, it, it is not a perfectly healthy wine and roses relationship. Mm-hmm. They have some major problems, and we're going to get to talk about that each other. Um, I mean, the, if nothing else, if anyone is doing a PhD in psychology and wants to teach a course just on codependence, throw out every textbook and just use this show as your textbook. Because, yeah. like, it is codependence 101. Oh, God. But it is still a beautiful, evolving relationship, you know? And... and, and I really love that in, um, like, I remember when Frozen came out, and there was a lot of discussion about why it was such an important movie, and one of the comments that was made was that in almost every Disney movie, the primary relationship in the characters' lives, uh, by the way, I also realize every now and then you're going to hear my GPS talking to us, I again apologize, Um, but you wouldn't want us to get lost, would you? Um... (laughs) But that the, the primary relationship in the characters' lives is almost always with a romantic partner. And then in Frozen, the relationship that is at the crux of the story is between the two sisters. Yep. And I was thinking about it after watching a lot of Supernatural that in almost every buddy cop movie, even though that relationship is in theory the central part of the movie, they still make very clear that even though these buddies love each other, one or both of them has a romantic partner who means more to them mm-hmm. than their buddy or their brother or their father or whoever it is. And the fact that it's supernatural, yes, they do have romantic relationships, and those are sometimes handled in really bad ways, but, but those are never the central relation. It's very clear that the most important person to each of these characters is each other. Yeah, and that their that family sec- is so important. And that their second most important figure is probably their father, and that their third most important is probably Bobby who becomes kind yep. of a surrogate father yeah, to them. Bobby becomes um, a better father to them than their father ever was, yeah. which is kind of great. Uh, so I'd say, yeah, that I, I would agree with that. To me, that's a, that's a really right. important part of the show. So, so moving on, though, into some of these, because ostensibly we're a podcast about ethics. Uh, so let's move on to some, some sure. ethical discussions. Uh, and if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about the, the whole who can we kill. And yeah. I think it's, a, it's a fascinating one. Um, that is dealt with in this show in kind of a, a weird, disturbing way. So for, for people who aren't familiar and who aren't interested, but want to not be completely lost on this, uh, our main character, Sam and Dean Winchester, they hunt monsters. That's what they do. That's their whole thing, right? Um, and the way they do this is they and drive I, around the country I, finding I, monsters. I, I, I would actually stop you there because I think monsters is in itself a fairly pejorative term. Oh, for sure. They, yeah, hunt, yeah. they hunt supernatural creatures. Right. They, they hunt uh, cryptids, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And supernatural creatures, right. So they, they, they say it as they hunt monsters, right? That's right. their thing. They're called hunters. There's this whole community of people who do this thing, who who go after the things that go bump in the night, or that's what they tell themselves. Um and for the first couple of seasons, most everything they fight is an unrepentant, uh, like, clearly a problem to the public health entity that they have to get rid of. And then there's this one episode, uh, dealing with a vampire, if, I, if memory serves. Yep. Yes. Who is really, really trying to tell them, no, look, like, we're, we're, like, is, this is the one where they're subsisting off of, like... They're drinking beef blood or something like that, and well, so there's two different episodes. Right. Um, and, and let me also just first say, I, I, I I'm agreeing. I'm glad we're getting into the more ethically deep questions. I do think all the stuff we said at the beginning about like the importance of the relationship of brothers and all that, to me, that falls under the purview of ethics. Oh, it's sure, about, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the importance, of the, the representation, like, but, but here, so and remember, I brought this up to you that there, there were there were two vampire episodes that really stood out to me. The first was. They encounter a bunch of vampires who are clearly trying to yep. not be awful. They're trying to live off of animal blood. They're trying to not kill people. And they're portrayed in an almost sympathetic way, although it's left very clear that our our heroes aren't sure how to feel about them. Right. Then, maybe half a season later, there's an episode that opens with Sam and Dean having captured a vampire who they quickly realize doesn't know she's a vampire. She has no understanding 
And then it's also clear that she hasn't actually caused much harm yet. I think she might have, like, been one or two. Like, she hasn't, like, gone on a murder spree or anything. It's right. just that they can tell she's a vampire. And in, frankly, one of the more disturbing scenes I've ever seen in the show, and they want it to showing it off screen so we just hear it, we hear this character, a young woman, clear, you know, piteously begging for her life, as we then hear very clearly that Sam kills her. Right. Um, and it's portrayed as, well, she's a, she's a, like you said, she's a monster. Right. She doesn't look like it. She hasn't done anything monstrous. She wants to be, do better with her life. But she's portrayed clearly as a monster. And Sam kills her. Um, because the perspective is, what Dean convinces him of is, she can't help it. There's no way she won't wind up doing terrible things. We have to kill her. Yeah, it's the, like, this is Hitler as a baby argument. Right. Right. Um, or even, like, not even Hitler as a baby, but more like, this is a scorpion, you know? Oh, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's but... just in its nature to want to sting you. Um, so what was your take on that? So, I mean, I gotta be honest. Whenever the Winchesters... Whenever the... Because it happens more than once, unfortunately. But whenever the Winchesters kill a thing uh, because of what it is rather than what it's done, I have problems with it. Yeah. Right? Um, like, I don't... I guess I just don't subscribe to this idea that because you have a particular set of characteristics, you are necessarily going to do evil or do harm to people. Right. But, the and, and part of it, I think, is is their upbringing and the mythos of the hunters themselves, right? They have this entire community. It, like, you could draw some parallels with some with certain modern groups in certain areas of maybe our country, I don't know. Uh, but you have this, this ideology being spread around that's reinforcing these ideas that certain characteristics are immutable. Right, right, and because they are immune, because they are immutable, if you accept that idea that this can't change, and it leads directly into this entity will do harm, it's consistent with that ideology that they would just go, well, let's nip this in the bud before it can do harm. Let's do, pre let's do preventative action for them. It would be the same as like, you know, getting a, a filling so that you don't have to get root canal. Right, right. It's, it would be that kind of surgical mindset. Of, Let's do as little harm as possible to make sure that we minimize the amount of suffering in the world. That kind right. of idea. And, and I think the way you phrase it about like kind of comparing it to the casual nature of like removing a filling, and also what you said about like reducing harm, I think an essential part of this is, and this goes back to this whole idea of who can you kill, that for Sam and Dean, and I think to some extent the writers, although later the writers play with this, but part of what they are trying to tell us is that a monster, as they would call it, a, a thing that is a supernatural being, does not have the same moral value as a human being. Right. And so to end its existence does should is not an act of murder. You know what I mean? If that was a person that Sam does that to, who is in that moment not a harm not a danger to anyone, is tied up, is helpless, and is begging for their life, what Sam does is by any definition cold blooded murder. Right. Unless you don't believe that that thing that he's killing, and I'm using thing because that's how they would think, like the person, the vampire, doesn't have the same moral value as a human being. Right. And we do see them have this this problem with humans, where they draw that line. Right. right. There's this hunter, oh god, what was his name? Um, he was the one who palled around with Dean for a while, but was really kind of twisted and, and off. Like, right. He was, he was not a good dude, right? At one point, he captures Sam because he thinks Sam is part, like, effectively part monster and, like... Right. Which he's... And that's a whole other question like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. The hypocrisy there. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, but... it, it, I just saw Black Panther again, so it's it's the one played by... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. T'Challa's uncle. Yep, But exactly. yes, that's... Yes. <laughs> I can't remember the character's name, and I can't cheat and use the internet like we do when we're... Uh, yes. Because, you know, it's... Been Most a important since, ethical like, decision, folks is car safety is going to go before podcast quality. Right. Hope you understand. Go ahead. The, the, like, yeah. Because the, like, like, I'm not going to lie. This, I think that was season three. Uh, I'm, we're on, like, season 15 or something like now. Like, I don't remember his name. That's legitimate. Because he does not show up again, except for that time he shows up as a vampire. Right. Uh, but, like, that's still back then. Anyway, um, so... They, they wrestle with this with him and decide, like, they, I guess, the, I think the decision's ultimately taken out of their hands, but, like, they really struggle with killing another human being. 
Right. But when it comes to this vampire, I really... And this, I feel, is a bit of an... Like, this is a criticism for the writing team. It's a bit of an inconsistency. Sam Winchester is the character that wrestles with that more, especially when he starts to self-identify as a monster. Right. Right? Um, and, and, like, what that means for him personally, which is also a bit problematic, right? Where, like, why does he have this con- this crisis of conscience when now he is the very class he's been persecuting against? It's right. very realistic, but it's very troubling. And, and we're going to get into this later, but I think one of the essential parts of the story, and at least the writers recognize this, and I give them credit for that, but one essential part of the story is that, uh, is that frequently both brothers are fully willing to violate their moral code for each other. Exactly. And I think one of the ways this comes up very much in the um, who do we kill context is, um, you know, Dean especially is very much a hard case about if they are demonic, if they are a vampire, if they are a goat, anything, they die. Yep. Pure and simple, no questions asked. Until it becomes very clear that his brother is part demonic. Right. At which point all the question and, and like I said, we'll get into the aspect of that as the relationship between the brothers themselves. But what I think that points to in this is that the really dangerous thing here is that what what basically is happening is, is Dean is saying, if I don't have any personal connection with the, with the other thing, the creature, the person, whatever, then it's easier for me to not ascribe it moral value. Right. And, and, and that is so dangerous. And that is consistent throughout the show. They encounter people who they knew uh, who have had bad things happen to them, and now they are, have some kind of supernatural characteristic thing that's a problem. And they they jump through hoops trying to not kill that person. Right. And so it's this it's this very troubling idea that if it's somebody that that you know that you're connected to, they get to have moral value. But if it's some random entity, uh, somebody that you don't know suddenly now you can just put him in a box. Right. And like, okay, you're in the vampire box, so you die, or you're in the human box, so I'm going to protect you. Even though, like, sometimes the humans that they have to protect are reprehensible beings, and sometimes the vampires they have to protect don't know they're vampires and don't really want to cause harm. And and here's where, um, to, to compare this to another show that, that I'm guessing most of you have seen, and if not, it's been so long that I'm not going to feel bad about spoiling, um, Supernatural in this regard is very similar to Buffy mm-hmm. because as much as I loved all seven seasons of Buffy and, 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 and a lot of some of the other related stuff one of my real frustrations with that show is it creates the idea and later it plays with it a bit but especially for the first couple seasons it creates the idea of vampires are always and forever morally bad because they've lost their soul like the soul becomes this like check mark of morality mm-hmm. um And that beyond that, that the people, the Slayer is supposed to kill every vampire she finds and never a human. And this is embodied by this major uh, dilemma and theory that happens in season three when Faith, who's a bit more of a radical hunter, uh, Slayer, uh, Slayer, uh, kills a human. And the issue here is that the human who she killed was far worse of a person and was an active danger to people much more so than some of the vampires they killed. Um, Debatable. Uh, at that point, most of the vampires they killed have been caricatures, right? Yeah, but even so, I mean, they were killing vampires two minutes after they rose from the grave. Sure, but, like, the show's... Tra- like, I don't want to, like, get into a super deep argument about this, because, man, I could talk for a long time about Buffy. Um, <laughs> we should do like, a Buffy show at some we, point. We should. Like, you, you already did one. Um, yeah. The concept of the Chosen and, and Apocalyptica. That was a great episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, Thank you. I wasn't on it, so I get to say that, right? <laughs> uh, that's how that works. We can uh, I can promote our own podcast if I wasn't on it. There you go. Um, so, anyway, but, like, we're, we're given to understand at that point that these things are just, like, people are their food, and they're not going to make any other choices than that. Right. And so, like, it, yes, like, they, if they can't, if there is no other way, um, and we find out that, like, there needs to basically be an external thing to make there be no other, or to make there be another way to have a right. spike with his chip, angel with his soul, it, it's this whole thing, right? Right. Um, but yeah, it's that same point, idea. Yeah, it's that still that same very morally black and white. Um, and it, it's just the kind of thing that always troubles me, is when you make killing easy. Um, especially because when it, when the thing that makes it easy to kill someone is whether they are so different from you that you can't relate to them. Um, and this, this is, yeah, exactly, yeah. 
No, 100% agree. We were like, if they're different enough, now it's okay. Right. right? That idea is pervasive in, in the stories we tell. And it's, it's insidious in our culture. And some people take that same kind of idea, but apply it into, into human beings who look a little bit different. Right. And we were 100% not okay with that, right? I mean, you hope so, but I think, frankly, I think all of us do that to some extent, you know? And that's, um, and it's, it, it, what I see in this show is, I, I'm going to say all of us do that to some extent, I don't mean this, therefore it's okay, I mean, that's a real, like, that's a problem all of us should be trying to overcome. Um, but what I see in this, like, I, I get the feeling, and you know more about the background of the show than I do, but I get the feeling that some of the writers think that's a problem and some of them don't. Absolutely. Because it feels kind of back and forth as to whether that is a problem or not. The writing team changes in later seasons a little bit. Uh, we lose some writers, we gain some writers. And one of the things that you start to see uh, past season five, which you won't, but that's fine, uh, is that they start to wrestle more with this idea of what, ha- like, who has moral value. Right. right? Um, do you, you remember the character Crowley? Yes. Uh, the Demon of Deals, yep. King of the Crossroads. Uh, he becomes a character that the Winchesters frequently work with. Yeah. And is definitely, like, definitely still a demon, definitely still a bad dude doing bad things, but they keep making, like, deals with him uh, to basically to save each other most of the time because if it's one thing the Winchesters will betray all of their oral, other morals for, it is to save each other. Yep. Um, but, like, <laughs> At some point, that character Crowley starts to become more complex. It starts to have actual like sympathies, and that they start to wrestle with the idea of okay, is a demon a demon a demon, or are there right. some demons that are okay because they're the demon you know? Well, and here's where it gets into an issue that you and I have talked about a lot, but that I think is such a recurring, important recurring issue, which is that to me, there's something very dangerous about saying. I will give moral value to something if I can relate to it, if right. I can develop sympathy for it. Because then, it, because basically, as I think we've talked about, once you establish that in the world there are very few actual legitimate mustache twirlers, mm-hmm. you'd probably develop sympathy for most villains if you at least have some understanding of what their story is. And so now the entire question becomes, who does or who does not get to tell their story? Well, and I think, to be fair to the show, to be fair to Supernatural, I think if you take a look at most of the monsters that the Winchesters kill, and you put a human being in the place of that monster, and you say, okay, now a human is doing these things, you would be okay with them dealing with that. Maybe not by killing it, but right. by doing something to stop that from happening. Oh, absolutely. Right? The fact that that killing is the option that is taken um, is the, the conceit is that that's the only way. Right? right, that you can't just let a ghoul run rampant, and there's no jail for ghouls. Right, there's no there's no vampire jail. You don't get to like turn them into the Camarilla. Right, uh, you like there's no other recourse. You kill them or they run free. And I will say one of the things I thought was interesting is at the very beginning of the show, the first like four out of five episodes, they're not dealing with monsters in any perceivable way. What they're dealing with is ghosts. Yep. And they're dealing with the way that they do ghosts is that often a ghost is the spirit of a human who died with a very legitimate grievance Mm -hmm. and now is not able to let go of that grievance and so is haunting people and doing bad things and stuff like that. But in those episodes, they're almost always portrayed very sympathetically. And where the Winchesters are not trying to kill that ghost necessarily, they're basically trying to help it move on to, like, wherever beyond death is, you know? Um, And so I remember thinking the first couple times we had just, like, monsters who were evil and had to be killed, it felt like a bit of a shift because I'd gotten used to this, like, oh, no, actually, this is a lot about, like, supernatural creatures that are kind of have some sympathy and just need to be moved on and that kind of thing. Right. Like, yeah, the very first episode is The Woman in White. right? Right. And that is a very sympathetic but, like, a tragic but also disturbing story of a woman who killed her family. Right. Right? Um, so the... But, 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 and the way they deal with it is to try to find a way to send those spirits off. But it's that same idea where, like, they were once human, so they have moral value. Right. Whereas, uh, like, 
it takes a very long time before we see a werewolf, or you mean a werewolf that is like, yeah, we don't actually want to necessarily kill this person because we, we kind of like them. We, we have some perspective on them. Um, it takes a very long time before we see a vampire that that the Winchesters don't snap just for the kill immediately. Um, so, and let's, let's move on to another part of this who can we kill question, which is that one of the things that often happens in this show is that demons and angels, it turns out, in order to function on this plane of existence, have to literally possess a human body. And that what generally happens is that that actual person, like their soul, their personality, whatever you describe it, basically kind of gets locked away. And now this demon or this angel is walking around in that body. Yeah, they're wearing the Edgar suit. Yeah, they're wearing the Edgar suit. <laughs> and there are ways that the Winchesters or others can basically force the demon or the angel out of that body and allow the person to reclaim the body. But that many of the ways of, that certainly what that often often does is allows the demon to survive, just run away. Yep. But that some of the other ways of banishing the demon, and certainly almost all the ways of actually like destroying the demon or the angel, do involve the destruction of the host. Yeah, they kill the host. This is very, and, very problematic when they get the demon knife. Right. And to me, this has always been a really interesting question, is since a lot of the, our, our superhero stories and stuff like that deal with mind control and possession and stuff like that, what do you do? Like, can you kill? What's the moral value of someone who is taking actions that are life-threatening and dangerous and have to be stopped, and they have no control over what they're doing? Well, this actually uh, ties in nicely to our previous episode, to our talking about Alyssa in yeah. season two of Jessica Jones, where here we've got somebody who is doing things that are, you know, they're a danger to the public health, right? The difference here is it's more problematic because, like, we can actually turn this around and say, well, what if it was Kilgrave making Alyssa do these things? Right now it's very close to the demon example. Right. Right? Because somebody, some other entity is responsible for these actions, but you can't you can't get rid of that entity expediently, at least, because they have to go through the whole exorcism ritual to get the demon out. You right. can't get rid of that entity without also killing the innocent, right? And in this case, they are literally an innocent. They have no culpability in their actions whatsoever. And are there circumstances where because of the danger that that gestalt entity poses, you have to, Right? where, like, that is the correct decision, right. ethically speaking. Yeah, and I think it becomes... I think one thing I like about the show, because I will admit, I think this is a moral question that, again, when the writers think they care about it, they pay a lot of attention to, and then sometimes they don't. But... Because um, the thing is, when Kilgrave is controlling another human person, harming that other human person won't do anything to Kilgrave. Right. And the added twist that Supernatural puts on it is that often the best way to full stop, final death, kill the demon is to kill the host. Yep. And that exercising it will solve the temporary problem, but leaves that demon just as free to go and possess someone else, sometimes very quickly. Um, yeah, and so what? So what? what's your take? Especially, like you said, once they get the demon knife, they start killing demons pretty constantly. Yeah, and, it, like, it's a... I feel like they're coming from the perspective of the, you know, uh, numbers game argument, right? That killing this one host with this demon saves more human lives. So it's, it's literally a utilitarian argument, right? right? Saves more human lives than saving this one person by exercising them because that demon will kill more people. Will kill more people. I don't like that argument. Yeah. But I think that's the argument. I think that's the position uh, when they start doing this, when they gain access to that ability. And it is true that sometimes uh, the demons have already ruined the host, right? Where the host is going to die. And this happens to them, I think, at least once, where they perform an exorcism and the host doesn't like wake up and be like, what's going on? The host has been dead the entire time. The demon's just riding around in the meat suit. Right. Right? Um, and so, like, there's never even a guarantee, necessarily, when they, when they, if they go through all the, the trouble of trapping them, that they're going to get that human life back. So, 
from a practical standpoint, I understand. I think it is very troubling. I think if I were in their position, I'd probably do the same thing, and I would I would agonize over it, but I probably would just go, nope, I'm going to have to kill the demon. And I'd probably also, because I don't want to be too judgmental of the Winchesters, if it were in somebody I cared about, now I'm exercising the demon, and that's, you know, that's on me. Guess what? I'm not a hero all the time. I would like to be the person that doesn't do that, but... Well, and that gets back to the issue we talked about a couple episodes ago, which is... I think we often have an expectation that a hero is supposed to be objective and that a hero, you know, we were both, me especially, but I think both of us were deeply, deeply critical of most of the characters in uh, Avengers Infinity War, Infinity War, because they were not able to put aside their personal feelings in order to like do the right thing. Um, and I think that's what makes, and maybe this is a good way to transition into this, into this issue, it makes it such an interesting part of the Winchester's dynamic, is that they are so willing, without really any sort of irony, to abandon all of their principles for each other. Right. Up to and including this idea of, of reducing harm, of like, of life is apparently a zero-sum game in their world, so they have to preserve as much as they can. Right. Um... But when it comes to when it comes to saving each other, now the rest of the world can burn if I get my brother back. And this gets worse and worse as the seasons go on. What they prove themselves willing to do in service of that goal, and it's in some ways it's very touching. It's very beautiful that their care for each other is that deep. It's also really upsetting. Yeah. Well, and so let's talk about this, especially because, um, and we didn't mention this before, but I actually think it's a very interesting twist on the whole dynamic. Generally, when we say, like, we're not exact with our language, but if you get technical, a superhero is distinct from a hero in that a superhero has powers of some kind. And... Like Batman's power of being filthy rich. Right. But even that, like, many... the world's greatest detective. Yeah, many would argue that Batman is not a superhero. Batman is a hero, but that certainly all the rest of them are, are superheroes to some right. extent or another. Right, right. Um, and I, but not to get too into the weeds of it, but by most definitions, Dean Winchester, at least, is yeah. not a superhero. Yeah, or a superhero. And even Sam has a few kind of powers, and in one season he gets deep into them. Yeah, but like, but even but, then he's mostly... Yeah. And so given that, I'm wondering what... We talked about the moral responsibilities we hold, like, superheroes, too, and people who are, like, superpowered. What is the moral... Like, no one is paying Dean and Sam to put the, the good of everyone else ahead of the good of each other. I disagree. Everybody's paying Dean and Sam because they... Dean and oh, Sam tax because, fraud, yeah. Well, well, credit card fraud. Credit card fraud. And they're, like... And, yeah, they say they hustle pool on occasion, but most of their money's coming from credit card fraud right. people. Uh, so yeah. that means that that's uh, us eating that bill. Well, well, so is that the answer? Is it that because they have sort of appointed themselves humanity's defenders, it is fair for humanity to hold them to a higher standard? So, I don't know. Like, if you if you want to be that crass about it and say, well, because we're paying them to do a job, like, they're not, they're still people, right? right. They're not super powered with some exceptions with Sam in seasons one and two and three. When does he... I, I don't remember when he, like, yeah. stops he, drinking the demon blood. <laughs> but, uh, stops having his demon blood addiction, which is definitely not a magic addiction. Definitely not something Buffy did. I don't know what you guys are talking about. Um, magic... Uh, powers are like drugs. I don't know if you've right. seen this metaphor before, but... <laughs> it's a pretty common one. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, so... So, so like, they're, they're people, right? They... Yes, they do some incredible things, like like digging up graves in a single night, cracking through the concrete that's laid over them in order to get at the bodies. Whatever. Like, some things you just concede because it's fiction and it doesn't make a good story otherwise. Right. Um, but, like, they, they are presented ostensibly as squishy humans, just like the rest of us. I don't feel comfortable saying that because, like, not because, it can't be because we're effectively paying them to do this job that we get to hold them to a higher standard. And I don't feel like they're... So, like, what's the difference between their job, which is ostensibly preserving human life, and the job of a firefighter? Well, I'm glad, because I would say, 
all I'm doing here is holding them to the standard I would hold a firefighter to. Right. It, to my mind, if a firefighter runs into, and I think this is pretty solid in their training, if a firefighter runs into a burning building, and in one room is their wife, and in another room is ten people who they've never met, the firefighter is supposed to save those ten people. Like, realistically, they don't always, and maybe not even often. But my understanding is, and, and if you're, if you've gone through firefighter training uh, and and want to write in and tell me I'm wrong or explain this, please do. But from the firefighters I've spoken to and from the research I've done, certainly with police, certainly with firefighters, and I think with most of these kind of professions, the expectation is that you're supposed to put your personal feelings in that moment aside. Well, this is the problem with automated cars too, right? This ethical dilemma, because the the algorithm you have to put in an automated car is sometimes it has to kill the driver. Right, right. Than kill... And then nobody wants to buy that car. Right, family five, yeah. Right. So this, I would 100% buy that that's, that's what they're instructed to do. That's that's the ideology they embrace. And I mean, that is that is a bucket, that, that is a load I don't think I can shoulder. So bravo right. to those people. Well, I guess this is sort of the main question we're, we're, we're wrestling with is if, if you're not willing to shoulder that burden, should you become a hero? And that's, I think, the thing, the question for Sam and Dean is... And I feel like, yeah, like, I feel for Sam, he tried to make that decision, right? right? And he, like, it's it's that thing, that, that trope that we see commonly where once you've touched the world, you can't get out of it. Yeah. Once you've touched the life, you can't get out of the life. We have each of the Winchester boys actually have, have a stint at being out of the life for a spell. And it doesn't work out. They end up getting sucked back in. Um, And it's at least in part because this is what they do best. This is what they do well. And they're not always perfect about it. But absent them, there's only... There aren't that many hunters. And apparently they're like the best or something because of destiny and reasons. And (laughs) something to do with with who they're... What what angel is destined to inhabit their bodies. Their bloodline. yeah, their bloodline. Yep. Um, so, and, and it's so like I feel like it is reasonable for us to say we should be able to hold them to that higher standard, and they fall short of it a lot. I think it's realistic that they fall short of it a little bit. Yeah. And sometimes they're just you know human and, and they make mistakes, right? And, and frankly, I think it's what I like about the show so much is because. As much as I want to hold heroes to that standard, you know, like, uh, uh, but I acknowledge it's going to be hard, you know? Mm-hmm. And and to me, one of my favorite episodes from early in the first um, uh, couple seasons, I think it's actually in season one, is, and this is after already, Dean especially has established, if you are touched by the demonic, we kill you. Mm-hmm. Whether or not you're good or bad, you are evil, you have to be destroyed. And then there's some kind of infection that's happening. And they've been making very clear that if you are infected with this, you're going to turn into, not even evil, but more like rabbit. Croatoan. You're talking about Croatoan. No, no, no. We're talking years before Croatoan. This is season one. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. Um, And I don't remember the details too much because I'll admit a lot of season one I kind of had on the background. (laughs) I was not paying too much attention um, because it really ramps up like later seasons. But even in season one. And this episode I tuned into a lot because the the idea was that there, there was some kind of like demonic infection that was happening. And um, just to be clear, also, there's construction on the road, so we have to drive a little bit on the shoulder. That's not us being bad drivers, we promise. You hear that shoulder noise. Um, but I'll let you know when it's me being a bad driver. How does that sound? Oh, you'll hear me saying, oh, shit. Yeah. Um, but oh, we're getting pretty well with that cursing. Too bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, but, that ship sailed. Yep. But the, the point is, you know, in this episode, everyone has been saying if someone's infected, we kill them. Get there, you know, there's no saving them, and then it becomes pretty clear that that Sam may have been infected. Are you and every- sure this is in Croatoan? I feel like it is because I remember this. Anyway, I mean, it's, it's it, not particularly relevant. I maybe they say it's so. Croatoan and then they just don't say that word again for four yeah. years. But I don't. It was years before the concept of Croatoan got introduced, um, and they may have done this plot line again. I think they, they no, did- they, they did it when when Dean jumps into the future and sees the future apocalyptic world. Where the Crotone virus has taken over the whole, the right. whole everything. But the first time, I believe, is either season one or two, where they encounter uh, the thing and they talk about the the town in 
was it Virginia or something mm-hmm. that got lo- the lost colony. Um, anyway. you, you may be right. I don't want to go too far in the weeds, but either, either way, whether or not it's protonin, the, the point being, when Dean has to apply the principles that he has said apply to everyone to Sam, he immediately says, fuck you, that's my brother, I won't do it. Right. And he almost kills other humans who want to do exactly what he was advocating. Right. And to me, that is completely ethically wrong. It is ethically wrong. And it's also completely believable. And I really appreciated the show doing that because it was showing that these people aren't perfect, that they're not going to live up to perfect standards, that they are human, which right. is probably a much more realistic thing to expect. And I don't think the show tries to, like, because sometimes you can do that in a way that's like, we're showing this to show just how heroic they love each other, that they will sacrifice anything. Yep. And, and this is the question we came up, we talked about a lot in Infinity War. I think the idea of sacrifice as a noble thing is often problematic, but but especially if you want to sacrifice me to save something, that is certainly not heroic on your part. Right. Um, and, and and that's the thing is it's not a heroic act on Dean's part; it's a human act, and I I appreciate that they push that question in that way, you know. And I like that they don't ever get because on the one hand, I think it's easy for any of us never having faced that situation to sit back and say, clearly Dean is wrong. If he has this principle, he has to apply it to anyone, even if it's Sam. Yeah. And on some level, I believe that. But I also know it's very easy for me to believe that. And, and maybe this makes me too much of an edge lord, but I like it when our heroes can be wrong. Yeah. Can do the wrong thing. And be flawed in that way. Like, it's, it's very believable, and it's, like I said, it's like it's bittersweet because it's touching, but at the same time, you're like, that is not the job you said you sat out to do. Right. And so, like, what are you even doing? And it, again, it gets worse later seasons. They, like, throw the entire world under the bus because they can't stand the thought of being away from each other. It's a textbook codependency. Uh, yes. It is their relationship. And, like, and I feel like some, in some ways that, that codependency undermines some of the more, like, positive, nurturing aspects of their relationship. But I don't think it's an either-or proposition. Yeah, no, right? I think it's true. And I also think um, the way, one of the things that I think becomes really interesting is, and you know, you and I talked about this when we talked about the Punisher and Kingpin a while ago, is we talked about what is the difference, that often the line of what we think of as heroic is when a person has goals and motivations that aren't just self-serving. You know, that it, that it is about, I genuinely want to help others, not necessarily just live out my revenge desire or my protection desire or something like that. Right. And and one of the things I think that we've explored and that I think Supernatural does a really good job of exploring is one of the most dangerous things a person can do is to convince themselves that they're being heroic and trying to save others when really on some level their motivations are much more deeply personal. And in Supernatural, I do think that they establish that because while I think on some level, I think Dean and Sam obviously do have empathy and they want to save humanity and they want to protect, you know, both individual people and and humanity at writ large. On some level, if you take a list of their primary motivations, protecting each other is probably number one. Staying loyalty to the legacy and memory of their father and while he's alive, not disappointing their father is a close number two. And saving the world is pretty far down, is, is lower on the list than either of those two. I mean, I think it is number three. It's just that the, the the distance between number two and number three is large. Yes. In terms of how much value, how much of their personal stake is in it. It's not like they, do, they don't, you know, want to save the world. Um, but, like, they care. And it, this is, I feel like this is learned behavior. Because what do we see beginning of season two? We see their father take that one mission that he's been going on, going after his entire life, of trying to find the demon that killed his wife and invaded their home that day, and ending that demon. And we instead we see him make a deal with that demon to save Dean, to save his family. Right. Right? And so 100% learned behavior following Dad's footsteps of... Making the bad choice because it saves the family. That's family is number one to them. And I think well, that idea, in just, just to finish the thought, yeah. 
the idea of family being important and family taking precedent over a lot of other things isn't inherently toxic, right? There's oh, nothing yeah. wrong with that idea in, in principle. Except for when you apply it in these situations where there's more at stake than just you and your brother or you and your sons. Right. It's the collateral damage aspect. Right. Which I... collateral damage, of course, being uh, we're killing demons in human bodies. We're right. We're clearly okay with collateral damage. And and even there, it's interesting you bring up that because I've always thought that that's a little bit more of a morally complicated situation because you could view that as he's com- the father is compromising his values to protect his family. But another way you can look at it is to say he's putting protection of a living family member ahead of vengeance for a dead family member. Sure. Because if the idea is the demon that killed my wife and harmed my son is going to harm others, then yes, there's some aspect of that. But it's never it's never really presented as that. It's much more presented as a punisher type, this person killed my wife, this person destroyed my life, I have to kill them. Mm-hmm. And on some level, I feel like giving that up to protect Dean... It still really has a lot of issues, especially the way it's done and, and the, um, the, the guilt that it puts on Dean and all of that. But I also see it as a very morally complex decision. Well, and it's in the same episode where he effectively yells at Sam for not taking the shot at the demon when the demon's in John's body. So, right. like, he tells his son to make that choice. And then, like, in some ways you could say that he does it. He sacrifices himself to save Dean to show them look, sometimes this is going to be the cost of of doing this job, that you may have to throw away something you value a lot in order to in order to do the the job of the hunter, in order to save people. Well, and I wonder, and I don't know if this is intentional on the part of the writers and if it is, it's absolutely brilliant or, what I'm about to say is something I think the writers are at least somewhat aware of subconsciously, but I don't know how intentional it is but we were having a conversation earlier about how what moral value do you place on like vampires for humans right I feel like one of the biggest like all of the Winchesters are in deep need of therapy (laughs) but perhaps one of the biggest reasons I think is that every one of the Winchesters places the moral value of the others significantly higher than the value of their own life and that's part of why each of them is horrified at the idea that the other would make a sacrifice that they are very willing to make themselves. Right. And the more I think about that, the more brilliant that appeals to me, that that, that, that seems to me, because that's such a real thing. Yep. Like, how many people do you know, myself included, like, who are happily willing to, like, do everything they can to talk other people out of, you know, burning themselves out. Yeah, and, don't make that sacrifice. Don't, yeah. Don't throw away all of your time. And, and it's always, don't do as I do. Because yes. it's, you know, I, you know, I myself in this way, it is so hard for me, it is so much easier for me to take care of others than to take care of myself. Yep. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but as I've paid a lot of money in therapy to discover, part of it's because I don't put enough value on my own self and my own self-worth, as I should. And I kind of wonder if Massive self-esteem problems are a big part of what all the Winchesters are going through in that regard. I think I think you you really hit on something there. Actually, I think that it, it's something that is explored um, in the show in terms of of their self-esteem. Actually, uh, turns out did you did you realize that Dean doesn't think very highly of himself? Then he puts on a face. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, duh. It's super obvious, even though they never come out and say it. Um, but like, it's it's this thing where like. There's this facade that they all present because they're, you know, these, they're you know, they're the ones who, who kill the things that you're afraid of. Um, but at the end of the day, I think you're absolutely right that they are, they don't value themselves, but they value each other. And so seeing the other person act in a way that they would act, it, it, it's like, no, I'm not worth it. You need, to, you need to be the one to live. You can't make the sacrifice for me. Right even though I will snap make that sacrifice for you. Like, it's... And it's, like... It's inter- it's also, again, a little bit touching and very sad. But, uh, really, I feel like it could be solved by having some kind of actual sit-down, like, let's, let's talk about our issues and figure out what we're willing to do and then not do anything else. <laughs> like, and not... Not maybe, I don't know, maybe don't unleash a... a 
apocalyptic level event because you don't want your brother to die. Like, right. maybe don't do that. Well, and I think that it does come down to, on some level, again, this topic of the inability of men to be able to express emotions to each other. Because, you know, so much of this is, I don't know if my brother loves me, and like that if I let him sacrifice himself, you know, what does that say about me, and what does it say about my feelings towards him, and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, just the way we are coded to think that this is that one of the most noble things, you know, that like the great stories of like, you know, cops or soldiers or other who will take a bullet for each other. Um, and all, I mean, that's an incredibly brave thing to do, but like, you know, and, and that scene early in Captain America, when he jumps on the grenade, that's the thing that proves his heroism. And I think for very good reasons, that is a very heroic act he does. But it's interesting to me that so much of the way heroism is coded, especially for men, Actually, no, I shouldn't say that because self-sacrifice is a huge part of what's expected of women in a very different way. But, but like, in terms of these military kind of stories for men, that that kind of, like, I'm going to take a bullet, but I would never let you to take a bullet for me right. is always what's expected. Right. Um, it's that thing where, like, we can't say how we feel about each other in, in any kind of real terms. So we're going to do things to show you. Right. And we're going to go so above and beyond because it's only in action can we actually express ourselves. It sucks. Uh, Matthew, I love you. I, I love mean you. that. You're a good friend of me, Jacob, and I love you as well. See? It's not it's that doable. hard, guys. <laughs> it's really not. I promise this is an AV school after special, but you know what? If you're listening to this with a friend, tell them you love them. It's a good thing to do. So what did we learn today? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, it is, it is about an hour. A it's bunch time, more it's super- time for superhero ethics, says. Uh. <laughs> it, it is about an hour, and uh, um, we're driving, and I don't want to go too late. Um, so, And there's a lot more on Supernatural we can talk on. But is there any kind of wrap-up stuff we want to touch on? So, uh, you, you mentioned it sort of in passing. Um, like, there's this... And we've talked about this a lot um, offline. But the, the whole thing with uh, that they did with the angels and the demons I thought was interesting, in that... Uh, and this is one of like my favorite portrayals of angels in media yep. because I felt like treating them as semi pre-programmed but still sentient entities that have an agenda and aren't necessarily altruistic which right. is and, deeply fascinating and, and let's show. give a, a brief explanation to those who haven't seen the show or have seen it many years ago and forgotten the way the show sets it up is that there are demons and, and the demons are all under the control of Lucifer the original fallen angel and they're sort of the bad, evil ones. And uh, originally the angels are presented kind of as like our heroes and our saviors, but it quickly becomes apparent that in, in a very, actually, for those who've seen Babylon 5, Shadows vs. Morlons kind of way, the angels want a cataclysmic battle with the demons because they want to know, a lot of it goes to like which one of them is more beloved of God and all of this stuff. Um, and, 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 and also just want to win. Yeah, and just wanting to win and wanting to and, and believing and believing that like Earth will be a paradise after the demons are destroyed, and not but so then, much giving a toss about the humans. Right, not giving a toss about the humans, and 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 I I love the way that's done, especially kind of from a, a theological mythological perspective, because it plays on a lot of the ideas of the angels being jealous of the humans and being more beloved of God and all this kind of interesting stuff that is hardly original, but it's interesting storytelling. I mean, I can't. But, I don't think like stealing from prophecy is a crime, right? Uh, well, it's a, having that prophecy be part of science fiction and that like uh, uh, hero fiction is a, is a thing. No, I mean the movie, the prophecy. Oh yeah, yeah. okay, okay. <laughs> I thought you meant general prophecy. Yeah, yeah, that classic film where Christopher Walken plays the angel of death. You know, yeah, the one. <laughs> it's a great. Movie. I actually really like that movie. Yeah, but, like it's a great movie. Um, but um, but yeah, but the, but the point being, so the and the, the angels are quickly revealed to be. Um, you know, by their definition, good, because they are fighting evil, but they are fighting evil with absolute and complete and total extreme prejudice. Hmm. And hmm. Maybe, maybe, hmm, a little bit like the Winchesters. They don't hmm, value humans because, hmm, they're not like the angels. Hmm. Oh, that's an interesting, hmm. uh... I wonder if there's a theme here. <laughs> <laughs> See, and that's, honestly, that's one of the ones where I'm not sure I can give the writers that credit. I hope that they were doing I, that. I think, I think we give the writers the credit for the angels being a, a stand-in metaphor 
I don't know if the writers at that point in the show were cognizant of the Winchesters being effectively complicit in this problem. Right. Of like, not identifying people who aren't like us as, as having moral value. Right. No, that totally makes sense. Um, but certainly I think what the angel, the, the other angel problem is one that the Winchesters absolutely, I think the writers know have, which is that they don't care about collateral damage. You know, yes. as, as you said, that put led us into this. And yep. I think that is, honestly, we could probably do an entire show about how that's portrayed. Because I, um, I think there's so much about it so yeah. well done. And, and some things I had issue with, but... And the reason why I wanted to bring up the angels and the demons is that, especially the angels, but even later on, some of the demons, um, we get we get a diverse portrayal of these, quote, monsters, unquote, because some of the angels are adversaries of the right. monsters, right? And then there's Castiel, who is basically always an ally, Right. Always helping out the always yeah, helping out the yeah, yeah. Yeah, almost always an ally. Often an ally. <laughs> Often an ally. Uh, sometimes an ally. Sometimes he's trying to be God. You haven't seen that season. Um, so that that's a fun one. Yeah. Uh, if you ever pick it back up. But like, but we, we have these, these different portrayals uh, within this classification of these supernatural entities. We don't get that level of of I, I guess we could say diversity of personality and and agendas. In, in our uh, in our other monsters, if you will, like right. you see that with the demons, uh, like Crowley becomes a much more interesting character, um, who's like still adversarial, but not a like snap kill on sight for the Winchesters, right? Even though he's like way way evil, you guys, like super <laughs> super evil, like real evil, um, and. Like, I, I forget if witches... Yeah, witches have shown up, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they get some witches that, that stick around and they keep interacting with that are, like, morally more gray. Right. Um, uh, Rowena is such a good character, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, and they, get into, and they get into things like... Like, earlier we were talking about the, the morality of killing the humans who've just gotten possessed by the demons. Yep. One of, I think, one of the most interesting episodes... Cause, and often that's portrayed as the demons just, like, pick a body and are like, yoink! This is mine now. Well, the one where we meet Cassiel's vessels family. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, that, that's a heartbreaking episode. That's a God, whole that's so discussion good. of itself. And that's also where I think the actor who plays Cassiel, I, I mean, give Fish that, Collins. how that man hasn't gotten an Emmy, I don't understand. Yeah. But no, I was going to go in a very different direction, which is there an episode of, and this is something that is very much a trope. Buffy did this well, and some other shows did this well, but still, it, it raises such ethical questions, is you've got a bunch of dumb, geeky kids. Mm -hmm. who somehow find a book of demonic worship and are like, you know what? I'm going to show those bullies a lesson. I'm going to summon a demon. And and now the demon's possessing that person. Like, right. this person's not a total innocent, but I'm not sure the death... Like, and it, it, it's a very, like... Yep. And, yeah, and so I applaud the show for bringing that kind of stuff up. Yep. Um, I would say the only thing, the thing I want to mention in closing, and this is not much... It, it's a topic we've, we've talked about before, but I think it's important to mention... Um, you know, one of the things when you watch shows from you know, Supernatural doesn't seem that old, but it is ten or fifteen years old at this point. It's, it's starting in like the early two thousands, I want to say. Right, right. Yeah. and and one thing is that I have found is that when you go back and watch something, where at the time it was made, something is considered fine that is now considered really problematic. They probably should have seen as problematic back then, but it's it sometimes can be hard to watch. And like my favorite example of this is Ghostbusters, where I love the movie Ghostbusters. It was one of my childhood favorites. By the standards of the time when Ghostbusters was made, Bill Murray is a romantic hero. We now realize he's a flat-out stalker, and the idea that he was ever a romantic hero seems ridiculous, but that was the perception of the time. In the same regard, one of the running plot points of Supernatural is that Dean is just a lovable old womanizer. You know, and isn't it so funny? And and I watch it now, and it's practically... It, it is, fairly cringeworthy mm -hmm. you know the way he treats women and more importantly the way the show makes a running joke out of the way he treats women and not that he's it's not quite 1950s james bond and like oh doesn't everyone want to be him but it is still the kind of like oh shocks there goes dean there goes dean instead of actually recognizing this person's kind of a predator and kind of doing some really yeah, horrible and, things and i want to say that the show got better about that and it did as the years went on and they got more woke. Uh, but then Scooby Natural happened mm. and he creeps on Daphne so hard. 
Okay. It's real bad. Yeah, I have not seen that and probably won't. And I and I and to be clear, I think the show does a good job of naming that his womanizing comes from a real place of brokenness and and actually sort of making him confront that. My issue is though that like even though they do that when they present the actual behavior, it's still done in kind of like a funny aw shucks kind of a way, you yeah. know? And that's where um, I have a problem with it. Yeah. Um but yeah, so this was our um, no outline, no computers, um, coming up with topics while trying not to, um, you know, trying to make sure we stay on the highway and don't get a ticket uh, uh, podcast. Um, we will be going back to uh, um, real uh, uh, sound systems uh, soon, I promise you. I don't want to say immediately because it's entirely possible we're going to record one more episode in three days when we drive back. <laughs> um, but most of our episodes will be of a better sound quality, we promise you that. But even so, I hope this was a good chance to, like, get into some good questions, get into some good issues. Um, and I really look forward to hearing what you guys have to say. Um, uh, uh, Jacob, any last words before I kind of wrap us up? Uh, no, I was going to string off a uh, set of late-season spoilers, but I've thought better of it, and I think I'm a better person because of it. Okay. So, um, yeah, so, again, Jacob, uh, thank you very much for uh, engaging in this kind of crazy thing. Um, I will well, say... Well, thank me after I edit this, <laughs> and we'll... Talk. Let, let's see how it sounds. Let's yeah. see how it sounds. Um, and all of you, thank you for kind of uh, sticking back, sticking back through us. Um, and um, you know, as always, if you have any questions, if you have any thoughts, if you want to tell us, you know, something you agree with, something you think was totally wrong, uh, tell us a totally different moral part or ethical part of supernatural that you want to get into. Um, you can email us at um, superheroethics at gmail .com. Um, You can find us on Twitter at superhero ethics. Um, I've also now started a superhero ethics Facebook group. The Facebook page is still there, but the Facebook group is actually going to be a much better way to have conversations and to keep things going. So I strongly recommend you join that. It's a great way to keep these things going. Um, and so uh, on behalf of all that, on behalf of myself, on behalf of Jacob, um, I want to make a joke about how we're pulling out of the driveway now, but only the magic players among you will understand that. Either way, thank you guys all so much for being a part of this um, car podcast, and we will talk to you later. Cast? Car talk? Car, car talk. Car talk. No one's yeah, ever used that name before, right? Yeah, nope. Trademark it. Put it in the books. We're car talk now. I'm Clank. He's Clack. That what? <laughs>